E bu da ne bu kadar kadar ne bu kadar. Hayır akşam da ne bu kadar. Hi there, good evening to everyone. Uh, finally, we are live. Uh, it's a great pleasure to to hear here with uh, all of you. To, uh, tonight, we will talk about gastro talk to the, uh, to the states, uh, featuring with Dave De Simon and Sam Patti. And now, let me introduce our president, Paolo Tegoni. Hi, Paolo. Hi, Giuseppe. Buonasera. Grazie. Welcome. Welcome. Grazie. Welcome everybody. Grazie dell'introduzione. Eh, come giustamente hai detto, sono Paolo Tegoni, il presidente dell'Associazione Gastronomi Professionisti, e chiaramente gastronomo, e sono qui per presentare assieme a voi, assieme a tutti voi gastronomi, eh, questo importante appuntamento, che è il primo appuntamento del, dell'anno 2021 per la nostra associazione. E associazione che è nata nel 2019 e grazie all'impegno di, di, di alcuni gastronomi pionieri eh, per far sì che la figura del gastronomo, la figura professionale del gastronomo fosse messa in risalto eh, e che, che fosse riconosciuta quindi è un'associazione che raccoglie tutti gli studenti dei corsi universitari italiani e non solo eh, legati, inerenti alle scienze gastronomiche eh, raduna anche appunto i gastronomi professionisti e anche i sostenitori che abbracciano i valori eh, dell'enogastronomia, i valori propri intrinseci eh, del, della nostra associazione. Quindi eh, è un lavoro importante, è una missione che ci sentiamo veramente di portare avanti eh, ormai, da, ormai da un paio d'anni eh, e quindi eh, siamo solo all'inizio e eh, appunto come dicevo eh, Essendo a febbraio abbiamo messo in cantiere con volontà, sono settimane che ci stiamo lavorando, questo appuntamento internazionale con due ospiti di eccezione che vi presenteremo tra poco. E, ma prima vorrei eh, salutare appunto tutti gli studenti eh, dei corsi di scienze gastronomiche che ci, che ci seguono da tutta Italia e anche dalla Spagna, da, dall'Università di Valencia e tutti i gastronomi naturalmente eh, in diretta con noi. Eh, e soprattutto eh, i, i, coloro che ci, che ci hanno aiutato, tutto il nucleo operativo dell'associazione dell in primis eh, Giuseppe Salvatore Palladino e Martina Mondini eh, che appunto prenderà eh, la parola tra poco. Eh, la gastronomia è una, è una branca importante della cultura, equiparabile a, alle arti, ha un valore straordinario e quindi noi ci portiamo eh, fautori eh, di questi valori, eh, andiamo avanti con la gastronomia come se fosse come dire, una missione, come se fosse qualcosa che riesca a um, contribuire nel socializzare, nel, nel fraternizzare, nell'abbattere le barriere, nel, nel contaminare e nel, nel, eh, nel difenderci da, da questo appiattimento culturale che stiamo vivendo di giorno in giorno. Quindi la gastronomia non è solo la sensorialità, non è solo la cultura in senso stretto, è un impegno civile che ci vede ehm, come dire, combattenti, passatemi il termine, eh, su tutti i fronti. Ecco, è un modo per difendere la cultura. E parlo dal punto di vista personale e credo anche dal punto di vista di tutti coloro gastronomi e non che ci stanno seguendo. Eh, prima di passare la parola a Martina, voglio ringraziare eh, i, i responsabili, i docenti, eh, i, i rappresentanti dei, dei corsi in scienze gastronomiche eh, degli, degli Atenei italiani, prima di tutto eh, il professor Gianni Segratini dell'Università di Camerino, la professoressa Giuseppa Di Bella dell'Università di Messina e la professoressa Mariangela Perito dell'Università di Teramo, 
con i quali siamo in contatto e eh, i quali hanno diffuso eh, la comunicazione di questo eh, spero e auspico importante appuntamento. Eh, detto questo, eh, mi preme a salutare e dare il benvenuto, eh, prima di lasciare tutto, la parola a Martina, eh, ai nostri ospiti, che sono eh, David e Simone e Sam Petty, direttamente da Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania. Eh, io sono molto onorato, I'm so proud to, to have here with us Sam and, and Dave. Uh, welcome with us tonight. Uh, good afternoon for you. And uh, I met Dave uh, more or less 20 years ago in Paris with our friends um, Gerard Pantanaccio from Café du Passage in Paris. So um, after a lot of years, many years, we, um, we are here together tonight uh, uh, to speak about uh, gastronomy, to speak about uh, anti-globalization, to speak about uh, Italian uh, sounding, and to speak about Italian culture in USA. So um, thank you again, Sam and Dave, and welcome with us tonight. Prego Martina, a te la parola. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a te Paolo. Welcome everybody to this uh, event we are arranged tonight. We are hoping to develop a constructive uh, dialogue between two different cultures, so the American one and the Italian one. As Paolo just said, we'd like to thank you, all the public that is assisting us tonight, is attending this lecture. And we hope that we get we we hope that we get the um, enough uh, of, um, of the reception of the participation of the public. We hope this is not just a lecture. We hope this is uh, some sort of activity that will involve also our public, uh, which is composed mainly by students from from Marino universities and others uh, gastronomy universities that are attending. Uh, as Paolo just said, I'd like to thank you, the professors that um, shared this event uh, online, like uh, Professor Sagrantini, Ribella, and Carito. And uh, we'd like to thank you all to, uh, for the participation you were like to attend tonight. And um, uh, I would like to switch to our guests as soon as we can. Uh, for instance, we are interested in their uh, experience and as uh, living gastronomes, living professionals in another culture, in another environment, in another reality, other than the Italian. Since you are both uh, uh, very keen uh, in our um, culture. I mean, you both come from Italian-American backgrounds and we are, we are very curious about your experience in the gastronomic world from your perspective. So we'd like to start with Dave. Uh, if you would like to start with sharing with us your experience in this field. <coughs> My pleasure. Thank you, Martina. And you. uh, you're welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paulo and the uh, association for this opportunity to exchange information and learn and hear. And congratulations on your program. It looks like you're doing some really great stuff. So that, that's very encouraging. Um, now, as a writer on uh, wine and food, stories have always been my focus. Uh, information about food and wine and places is of interest to people, but mainly and most importantly, I focus on stories about individuals, their stories, their history, their struggles, their challenges, successes, failures, things that we all experience, because by doing that, it's a way to make food and wine and culture universal, because everyone can filter it through their own experience, their own story. So uh, as Martina said, my uh, story uh, in part is as a uh, grandson of Italian immigrants. My grandfather came from Calabria, a little town called Lago, which is in the hills above Amentea on the coast, beautiful little town. 
Uh, many, many people immigrated from Lago to the United States, to Canada, to Argentina. In fact, there's a uh, organization now for the uh, Lagatiana del Mundo because there's so many people from Lago all over the world. Uh, my grandmother came from uh, Montella, which maybe some of our Italian audience will recognize as the, uh, the place of chestnuts, Castagna de Montella. They're supposed yes, to be yes. <laughs> I've never been there, but uh, apparently uh, that, that it's famous there in Campania. So um, when I think about my grandparents, they came around 1900. I mean, they're really incredible stories, individual stories that influenced me from the beginning because they take huge risks. They let, and it took courage to leave their families behind, to leave their culture behind, to leave their, their, their language behind, their friends, and they went to a totally new place in culture. But they did, uh, they did very well. Uh, they had nine children. The oldest was my aunt, Aunt Frances, and then they had eight consecutive boys, including my father. So that was quite a story in and of itself. Uh, my Aunt Frances, she uh, was kind of a second mother to uh, my father and the other boys, but she had an amazing story in and of herself. She was married at the age of 15, which uh, to an Italian uh, immigrant, an older gentleman, and she had six uh, children of her own. And she had a lot of uh, difficult times and struggles, but the focus of her uh, life really was cooking, home uh, making, and also winemaking because her husband designated her as the winemaker of the family. And like a lot of Italian immigrants, uh, they made uh, wine at home and, um, and she had a, uh, a real knack and a real love for making wine. And most importantly, the, day, the man took up to you. But yes. so you tell me that your auntie used to make wine in the uh, in your in your family. I mean, yes. uh, in your really yes. close circumstances. Only for uh, home consumption. She didn't sell it to anybody. Okay. This was for the family. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and that was legal because. In America at the time, uh, selling alcohol was illegal, if you can believe it. So many Italian immigrants mm -hmm. had to make wine for their own home consumption. That was one of her jobs, was to make wine. But um, as a kid, uh, that made quite an impression on me. And it sort of started me uh, thinking about wine at a very early age. And, uh, and so I really knew my auntie, Frances, mainly in her 60s, her 70s, and her 80s, when she was older. Uh, we would go to her house for Italian dinners all the time. She made uh, something that always stuck out of my mind was uh, pasta alle olio. And still, okay. to this, still to this day, you know, I, I, I judge all pasta alle olio against hers because that's not an easy thing to make well. And you see that... Yeah. Uh, you see that in, in Italy a lot, but in America, there's typically uh, pasta with uh, red sauce. That's the stereo type of uh, Italian pasta, but not for her. She liked the alle olio. And uh, another thing about her, which was um, very central at these dinners, was music. My uncles played music, and we always had music. We always had wine. We always had food. And it was fun, and it made an impression on me as a, as a young person. Um, and so I think that from a very early age, I had this idea of food and wine and music as, and storytelling because they always, told, they always told stories around the dinner and, and it was something that, um, that came naturally to me. So as an adult, when I began, began as a writer in my, uh, in my 20s, uh, searching for stories about food and wine and music and, and culture, we didn't call it culture, but that's actually what it is. It came very naturally. And I, I consider myself very fortunate because as a writer, I've had the opportunity to travel not only around the U.S., but to France, to Germany, and of course to Italy. And I've had many, many memorable trips and moments over food and wine, and, um, and uh, including visits to Parma and Modena, uh, which was really great. 
and 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 making these discoveries uh, about uh, food and wine and culture for me sharing those stories uh, is important because when you share those stories when a reader reads it they get a new percep perception of reality and 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 I think uh, a lot of times in America the uh, perception of Italy is not as nuanced as the reality really is the diversity of Italy so I try to bring that uh, forward in my stories and also it's it's really miraculous I think uh, it can be a miracle sometimes sharing food and wine and what it can do and change your life because as Paulo mentioned I, I met him for the first time 20 years ago just by happenstance and I happened to go into a place uh, that our mutual friend Gerard Pantanacci, Le Café du Passage, had in Paris a wine bar, and we sat down and had drinks, and we talked probably for five or six hours, along with another gentleman who's become a friend as well, uh, Marco Pelletier, who owns a restaurant in, in Paris and is a very well-respected uh, uh, sommelier. So... It just goes to show you never can tell with food and wine when these surprises will happen and they can really change your life and give you information that uh, can be valuable in many different ways. So um, I think that uh, for me, again, uh, when it comes to food and wine and gastronomy, it's all about telling stories and uh, sharing those stories and uh, it's a great pleasure. And it, yeah. I think Americans are, are a little intimidated by the concept of gastronomy. That word, you very rarely hear gastronomy in American culture, but it's really just to me a way to learn about food and wine and to share it with others. To me, that's what gastronomy is all about. And as professionals, over and above as a writer, I did own a restaurant for three years, and I think that um, in the restaurant business, stories are crucial to, to having success in that business as well, sharing them with your customers, because yeah. you know, food and wine is more than just something that you consume. It's something that can inform your mind as well as your body. So that's my uh, story in terms of gastronomy, and thanks for the opportunity to participate again. Thank you for participating in our event, Dave. Allow me to translate for uh, the Italians and, um, and other of the public. I mean, uh, Dave, adesso ci ha spiegato uh, della sua esperienza nel campo dell'enogastronomia, quindi che la sua passione è nata per lo più da un background familiare, quindi da sua zia che uh, era la manufatturiera del cioè lei creava il vino in casa, aveva la, mh, questo compito in casa e aveva appassionato eh, Dave appunto all'ambiente. Poi la vita ha portato Dave ad appassionarsi verso questo settore e a creare una sorta di, eh, di collegamento tra il suo approccio professionale al storytelling, comunque a raccontare esperienze, a raccontare quelle cosa quelle esperienze abbiano portato alla sua persona attraverso comunque anche i mezzi come vino, vino gastronomia, eh, dipende poi dai viaggi che Dave ha fatto, eh, noi sappiamo che Dave ha fatto molti, molti viaggi in Europa eh, a livello enogastronomico e più tardi faremo altre domande al riguardo. Prima ci stava spiegando anche di questa esperienza che aveva fatto a Parigi da un suo conoscente. Dave, would you remind me, please, the name of your friend in Paris who had a restaurant? Gerard. His name is Gerard Pantanacci. The first name Gerard is... Gerard Pantanacci. The second name is Italian. Gerard okay, Pantanacci. Okay. So this guy, uh, questo, questa persona aveva questo ristorante a Parigi e Dave diceva che Uh, il più grande contributo che poteva, eh, che poteva citare adesso era appunto davanti a un bicchiere di vino con un amico eh, in, questo, in questo modo eh, perché comunque eh, il cibo collega le persone e collega il loro modo di essere in un certo senso 
e stasera andremo a vedere in quale modo tra, attraverso le diverse culture questa cosa può essere percepita. Thank you Dave for your contribution. Grazie, prego. And if there's any questions from the public. Is that uh, yes, we have a question and we can invite uh, people uh, to type on the chat if you uh, mm -hmm. ask any question we will uh, make to to Dave. Then uh, the qu first uh, question is uh, of course for Dave and uh, is, do you think Italians have to work better in some way to, to let Americans uh, understand the diversity? Yeah, I, I think that um, <clears throat> I began writing in the 1990s and at that time there was not much effort from uh, Italian uh, winemaking associations, etc., to tell the stories. But it's improved, obviously, with social media uh, over the last um, 20 years, almost 30 years now. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and I think that, uh, yeah, that could be something that is a strength But I, again, I, I'm seeing more and more of that, with, especially with the, for example, the cheeses, the various cheeses of uh, Formaggio, of, uh, of uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, and uh, the different cheeses, as well as the hams, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's a strength. And I think that some regions are stronger than others. Like, for example, um, uh, the area of uh, Trentino Alto Adige. You, you see a lot of information about those products more and more in America. Uh, whereas uh, Campania and Calabria, I think, are catching up. But it certainly is a, a strength, the diversity of the wines and the food and the cultures and the languages. So it's something that can be uh, used as a foundation for further understanding, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, for now, we don't have uh, any more questions. Okay. Then uh, I I make talk, uh, Martina. Okay. Thank you, Giuseppe. Now, uh, Sam, if you'd like to interview to intervene uh, tonight, we'd like to hear your ex personal experience as well as a gastronomic professional as you are. Okay, you know I that I'm... you are a very passionate person about coffee, and we have a lot of passionates about coffee tonight attending this. Right. Uh, I, I want to uh, mention something that Dave mentioned. Gastronomy isn't known or viewed in the same way in America as it is in Italy. So I really wanted to start off by talking about your organization. I am absolutely in awe. Of, uh, of your association. I think you're doing a great job. It's a wonderful view of, uh, of, of food and wine. It's, it's really a, a view that really needs to be shared. Uh, and I'm really sad. Uh, David and I had planned to bring a, a group of tourists uh, to the Parma area this fall, and uh, we've had to postpone our trip. So uh, I look forward to that may maybe next year. Uh, but so. <laughs> by, by way of introduction, Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge that your organization is uh, soon to celebrate its uh, second birthday. Uh, and I I'd like to recognize and praise, I think, the focus that you guys have really concentrated on the idea of the, of the study and the appreciation of, of food and wine. And I learned a new vocabulary word, ano gastronomia, which I think is, uh, is a very beautiful uh, uh, word. Uh, one of the things this important to me in this whole concept of gastronomy and and i think the thing that you can teach uh you know teach the people in america is this idea of the uh, the primacy uh of food first of all uh as sustenance and also as nutrition so when we talk about food this needs to be where the, uh, the where the primary emphasis is and uh so so food is really the bread of life in in, in every sense And, and we have to keep that in mind. And when we talk about the, the totality of food, uh, we also have to remember that in the world, uh, there is a problem with world hunger. And that's one of the problems that I think that people who are interested in every aspect of food really need to think about how we can uh, eliminate uh, uh, 
world hunger. And I think that that's an important issue. But uh, equally as important uh, is the job of uh, investigating uh, what I refer to as uh, the duality of food. Uh, and the duality of food are all those other things that food gives to us, uh, such as uh, the promotion of uh, social interaction, family ties, ethnic heritage, uh, pleasure, art, uh, a, a little trip into the exotic, food porn, uh, food culture, uh, and creativity. So food is, is at the heart of everything that we do as human beings. Uh, it sustains us, uh, but it also opens the world to us and uh, opens up new ideas and uh, new ways of, of doing things. And uh, I think that your, your organization really understands the prepotency of food uh, and it's clearly stated at the very beginning of your website. And I was just fascinated as I read into the website and I saw a reference uh, in there that really uh, was uh, pulled from uh, your manifesto uh, and is the introduction to your website uh, where you really call for the focus of food on science, culture, economics, and ethics. And that's really an important way to do things. And that's why I'm so in awe of... Uh, of your organization. You just have a, a complete understanding of this concept of food and all the things it does for us and how important uh, it is to us. And I'll mention something about that a, a little bit later. Uh, just to fr uh, further extend this idea, I found it interesting uh, that uh, uh, Beppe, uh, who is, uh, you know, obviously one of the leaders in the association and a board member and our host tonight, uh, really understands this idea. And obviously this idea has spread throughout the organization uh, because on his website, uh, his, he presents his food philosophy as one which is based on quality and sustainability. So, uh, so he's somebody who, uh, there's an expression in English, when somebody says something that they believe in and really carry through with this idea, when they really hold fast to this idea, we refer to that as talking the talk and walking the walk. So the idea of quality and sustainability reflects right back on uh, to what is the purpose uh, stated in your manifesto for, for the association. Now, uh, to get a little bit more personal, uh, I own a company in Pittsburgh called La Prima Espresso Company. Our goal uh, is to uh, create Italian style espresso and cappuccino. Uh, I'm not naive enough to think that I can make an espresso uh, or a cappuccino like the Italians. If I need an excuse for that, I can simply tell you that the water's different. So I, I just can't do that. But uh, I, uh, we roast coffee, we blend coffee. I can't blend coffee like the Italians. They know some secret uh, that I can't uh, particularly uh, get my hands on. Uh, but one of the guiding precepts of La Prima is actually this concept of sustainability. And I, I think we need to have a, a global view of, uh, of sustainability. And at La Prima, we look, look at uh, uh, the idea of sustainability from four different points of view. First of all, I own a company, I have employees. It is critical that as we do business, we pay attention to good business practices because we have to sustain the company itself for the employers, uh, you know, yeah, for the employees' own good, for the employers. So it's, 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 it's absolutely, utterly important. The second area is Mother Earth. Uh, we have to uh, support uh, in some kind of susceptible way uh, the idea of the farmers who grow our coffee. Thirdly, uh, we have to support uh, Mother Earth, uh, the farmers that grow our coffee, and Mother Earth uh, and, the, and the farmers who process our coffee. Those two areas are really important. And finally, uh, we, uh, we have maybe a, a small worldview, but we really have to take care of the community that we live in. And that is Pittsburgh. So we're very much oriented towards supporting uh, things that go on in Pittsburgh. So that's how we operate our company. So this idea of sustainability runs all through this whole process of food. And it makes food uh, an even more important uh, uh, thing. And uh, it gives us even a, great, a greater mission. Uh, now, um, in, in summation of, uh, of my comments, uh, when all was uh, said and done, uh, it, boy, it's, uh, every, you know, at our bar, we have a bar in the strip that Dave mentioned a little bit earlier. Where a lot you know, of you have three in Pittsburgh, is it right? Pardon me? We know you have three uh, right, bars in Pittsburgh, is it right? 
Right. But the one that is 32 years old is in, in, in the market area of Pittsburgh, which is called the Strip District. And a lot of Italians come there. And uh, every week I put a, uh, uh, an Italian proverb on the blackboard. And uh, in our discussion tonight, I think the most appropriate uh, proverb that I can think of that really gives us an understanding of, of the essence of food uh, is the well-known proverb, a tavola siamo tutti uguali. And I just want to... A tavola siamo tutti uguali. You're right. 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 So uh, that, that's, uh, that's where we come from. All righty. That's all I have to say for right now. So let, let's continue. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to translate for our public, if you, if you allow it. Okay. Uh, allora, Sam ci ha spiegato uh, di cosa si occupa fondamentalmente. Sam crede nella, nel, negli stessi principi dell'associazione gastronomi professionisti, quindi nel, um, uh, nel dare importanza a tutti quegli aspetti che sono sia mh, scientifici per quanto riguarda l'approccio verso il settore alimentare e non gastronomico, eh, sia quelli dal punto di vista culturale e umanistico. Quindi ehm, mi ha spiegato anche in seguito per quanto riguarda la sua esperienza, la sua azienda, quindi la prima espresso che a Pittsburgh ha, di, ricordiamolo, tre eh, punti vendita dove lui... Eh, eh, tosta e vende caffè eh, espresso e cappuccino per, per lo più per la maggior parte e ha ah, ribadito il concetto che il primo eh, aspetto di interesse è per la sua azienda quindi comunque tutelare i suoi operatori affinché la qualità venga rispettata fino a entro certi termini eh, sia per quanto riguarda la sostenibilità quindi comunque la possibilità di fornire a chilometro zero per quanto riguarda i propri clienti di caffè di qualità e principalmente rispettando le, eh, le linee guida che mh, la sua esperienza gli ha insegnato eh, per portare avanti la propria azienda. Eh, Giuseppe ci sono domande dal pubblico? Uh, no, unfortunately, no, but maybe yeah. we have some comments. I have some questions to ask about Sam. Ah, we have, one. Know, we have one. Yeah, okay. we have some. Because so. I know that Sam um, also um, donates some of his earnings to a certain um, organization, let's say, uh, which is a... Uh, 412, uh, um, I don't really recall the name, uh, Hero Blend. Yes, that's it. Yeah. I know that you are willing to eliminate hunger from, the, uh, from all over the world to help uh, less fortunate. Quindi, uh, in, noi abbiamo studiato che la prima, uh, attraverso la miscela Hero Brand, dona un pound per, o un dollaro, in realtà un dollaro, per ogni eh, pound di miscela Hero Blend che viene venduta a un'associazione che provvede all'eliminazione della fame del mondo, quindi vorremmo sapere da parte di Sam un po' di più rispetto a questa iniziativa. Right. Uh, Sam, do you understand us? This coffee is uh, a coffee in support of uh, getting rid of uh, uh, spreco alimentare. That's the, that's the idea. Yeah. It fits into that. And then I'll just show this other one I have. We also do the same thing with the blend that we call uh, Rachel Carson. Do you, know who, Carson. do you know who Rachel Carson is? Rachel Carson is from Pittsburgh, and she is the mother uh, of the modern environmental movement, and she was from Pittsburgh. And so we support this program. Uh, which is at uh, Chatham University. It's a university in Pittsburgh. And actually, Chatham University has a food studies program. And they work uh, in conjunction uh, with some of their programs with Gusto Lab uh, in Rome. So th those are a couple things that we do. So you work with? Uh, I, we work with Chatham University. They have a food studies program. And their food, the food studies program has a program in Italy every once in a while, and they work with Gusto Lab in, in, uh, in Rome, the university. Quindi lavorano con un laboratorio di Roma in, in Gusto Lab. Right. Right. Gusto. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a question for uh, for Sam. Okay. So, uh, what has been the funniest situation when uh, trying to explain some particularity of a dish or gastronomic tradition in Italy to Americans? Well, I think certainly uh, when I started my business, I sold espresso and cappuccino. And uh, so you get a three ounce cup and you, you give people one ounce, uh, you know, uh, 25 uh, millimeters of coffee and they have to pay for a dollar. Uh, and they would say, well, why am I only paying a dollar for such a small cup of coffee? So I think there was that transaction of uh, having people understand what espresso uh, and, and cappuccino, uh, you know, really were. So I think the, that that's probably the thing that comes uh, to my mind uh, most clearly. Well, 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 well. Dave, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Beppe? Sorry? We have uh, another question to Sam. Uh -huh. ah, Sam. Just a second. Can I read the question? Uh, it's for Sam from Daniela. Uh, what, what do you think uh, of uh, the Italian sounding phenomenon and uh, uh, taking care of Americans? How do you how do you think they behave towards Italian sounding products? Well, I, you know, he, here's what I know: when a product travels outside of its uh, native land, uh, it gets changed. Sometimes it gets changed for the better, uh, but in many cases it, it gets changed for the worse. Uh, and I think that a big part of the responsibility uh, to avoid this idea of fake Italian food uh, is for the Italians to control uh, their product as much as they can. And at the very least, I don't know that there's any legal basis to do this, but they at least have to try and define as clearly as possible what the product is so that maybe a person could recognize this isn't the same product that I ate in Italy. I'll give you an example. You'll appreciate this maybe. This is part, oh, well, seeing how you guys are in Parma, this is Parmesan cheese. Let us see. Yeah. Man, I'm not doing very well here. See yeah, you sure that's Parmesan. Yeah, it, it's, it, you know, it's basically fake cheese. It's Parmesan or Parmigiano. Yeah, it's, but I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, it's fake cheese, but Americans would buy this on the shelf and think that they're buying an Italian product and they're really just buying a, uh, a fake product uh, made, by, made by an American company. So, uh, you know, th th this happens uh, all the time. And uh, you should appreciate that because you're from Parma. But the relationship between this cheese and Parmigiano-Rogiano is uh, the difference between eating grass and lettuce, I think, or, or maybe even worse. Uh, I have another product here that you'll appreciate. Uh, this, is a, this is a cappuccino. This is a cappuccino from, uh, from Starbucks, okay? Uh, the relationship between this coffee and what you would drink in Italy uh, is probably pretty clearly identified simply by the size of the cup. Uh, this is a, a single espresso and then milk and foam in a 12-ounce cup, okay? as opposed to uh, a, a more traditional uh, Italian-style espresso in a, an Italian-style espresso cup. So these are the kinds of things that... Uh, that, that you have to understand. And, and again, if Italians would define uh, and market uh, their product and what they really are, that could go a long way, I think, in, in solving uh, these, uh, these problems. Having said that, uh, there is a very, very well-known uh, Latin uh, proverb uh, or saying that goes back, you know, centuries or millenniums called uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware. So you just, you just really, you really have to, uh, I'll pay attention. Dave, can you add anything to that? 
Well, well, Sam. Yes. And now we have a question for Dave. Uh, okay. Is Calabrese food and wine well known in Pittsburgh and uh, in USA? Uh, I would say uh, not, not really, no. Um, there are a lot of uh, people who came from Calabria to Pittsburgh, uh, but um, the, they have, because I've had the opportunity to visit in Calabria, and see some of the food there and experience it, I don't think that um, there's a direct um, recognition of those foods in, in Pittsburgh and the U.S. in generally. Uh, although um, some things like uh, some of the cured meats and, and that sort of thing uh, are very popular here without being associated with Calabria. Would you agree with that, Sam? Well, I, I, I think that uh, now almost everybody knows Sopasaka as a salami. Sopasaka, they, right. Whether or not they identify it with Calabria or not, they know it's special. And exactly. certainly, you know, you know, in Pittsburgh, it, it's, it's very well known. And I, yeah. I do think that with places like uh, Whole Foods and places like Italy, uh, Bastiani's uh, restaurants, you're starting yes. to see some of these special products like dried figs that are covered with chocolate. Uh, right. I don't know that this happened. But every year at the beginning of the year, the newspaper does an article and it says what's in and what's out. So what, what have we enjoyed last year, but it's going to be replaced by that. And a couple of years ago, uh, this article said that bacon uh, is going to be replaced by induya. And, and I think okay. that maybe something like that, that's happening. But I think what this tells us is we have to take more trips to Calabria so we can yeah. you know, uh, enjoy the Calabrian food even more. And uh, while we're at it... Uh, I think was it last year or the year before the Amaro, uh, you know, uh, th there's an Amaro in, uh, in Italy near Crescenza called Jefferson Importante. And it was, uh, it was selected as the number one uh, Amaro in, in, in a world competition. So I think, uh, well, yeah. we, we know this travel uh, to Italy is not simply today as it was years ago, where you went to Rome, Florence, uh, and Venice. Now people are starting to travel south. And a lot of third generation Italians who come from Calabria are ready to say, well, I'd like to go visit and see. I just want to see the place where my, my grandparents or my great grandparents came from. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes back to something that you mentioned before. Technology is changing the whole game with visiting Italy, yeah. the glo globalization of tourism, uh, the globalization of food. So it's, it's a new ball game with all this technology. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that new generations of Italian Americans would be willing to travel more in Italy and in the areas where they come from, actually? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I, I think that th there is a market. Uh, two things. One of the, I, I've always been interested in what the viewpoint of Italians was towards Italians, Italian Americans. And I think that one of the things that I've discovered over the years is if you're an American, uh, in America, Italian Americans are very proud, and you know people say, "Well, I'm Italian. I'm Italian." So when they meet an Italian, and say, "Oh, I'm Italian too," then they start talking to them in Italian, and they realize that the Italian Americans don't speak Italian. So for the Italians, how can you be an Italian if you don't speak the language? The number one marker of ethnicity is language, and unfortunately, in America, the Italian Americans don't have the language. So that, yeah. you know, so, but now I think there's a willingness and, you know, there, you know, there are so many trips now in English, easy to travel. There are translators and I, I have one idea, one more idea I've got to get out so I can shut up. We're talking about food. Okay. Italy, uh, America is a, is a country of immigrants. Italy is a country of diaspora between 1861 and 1985, almost 30, 30 million, 30 million Italians left Italy. They left Italy primarily for one reason. They wanted to eat. They didn't have any food. Yes. So yeah. when we're talking about yeah. food and world hunger, this is what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, food that's really is, true. Is the critical. Nobody is going anywhere unless they're eating. Yeah. There was a historic period when Italy had really high prices for food. 
So they they had to try somewhere else, otherwise they would die for hunger. And that's uh, that's really bad for the background they came from. But what they achieved by challenging themselves, I think it's the Mm, the most surprising thing that happened to their society. I mean, they uh, they they moved to uh, overseas to try to have a better life. They wouldn't know if that was going good or bad. I mean, if that was a good choice or a bad choice, they had to discover that. And what we have now is the result of their efforts. And uh, I'm sorry, allow me to translate that because our, our public needs a bit of uh, alternative uh, message. Quindi abbiamo parlato adesso del problema dell'Italian sounding, quindi del fatto che molti prodotti sono commercializzati all'estero come italiani, ma non sono italiani a tutti gli effetti. Quindi abbiamo cercato di differire quale sia la differenza fondamentale tra queste due cose. Cioè un parmesan perché è diverso da un parmigiano, perché viene coltivato o me, cioè viene prodotto da un'altra parte e quindi ha determinate caratteristiche che possono essere attribuibili a quel territorio o meno. Giusto? Dunque, partendo dal parmesan siamo, partiti, siamo arrivati al fatto che eh, perché c'è la cultura del parmesan, quindi why people do produce parmesan in the US states, because there was an Italian background and they tried to produce the same product without the, the resources, but there's different We have, a, we have a question for uh, Sam. Uh, Nell'ottica di riduzione dei rifiuti da plastica, come si approccia la sua azienda con il packaging, soprattutto uh, se fa take away? Wow. Uh, what we do is uh, we have, for instance, we bought bags for our coffee that were uh, as compostable as possible. We do the same, we use the same cups the Starbucks uses, uh, and they're as conscious as they can be in terms of uh, being friendly to the environment. But it's, it's really, a, 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 I mean, we live in a world of plastic, we live in a world of takeaway, and uh, it, it's just really hard uh, to recycle. I know I've been in Calabria where They would come every day and recycle, uh, you know, a different product, garbage, plastic, uh, recyclables, whatever, whatever case it might be. We now we don't have any place to to to, to throw all that stuff, if, that, if that's the right word. Uh, so we try to be conscientious, but it's really, really, really very difficult. I know the neighborhood that I w work in is trying to recycle. And so uh, I asked uh, the question one day, what city in the United States is a good example of some, a city that recycles well? And the answer was maybe San Francisco. So th there's not even a role model. Very difficult problem. So we have um, a question for Dave. Okay. Italian food is copied uh, all over, over the world. What do you uh, counter the fake Italian product? Yes, um, <clears throat> in the wine, I, I know ma mainly about wine. For example, uh, Chianti is a, a term that is often misapplied. Uh, but in terms of uh, writing stories, I think that's what I've always tried to do is educate readers and tell them what is an authentic Chianti, or um, you can pick any number of, uh, of items uh, in, in the wine world where people don't necessarily immediately know that the grapes have to come from per a certain place in Tuscany to make an authentic uh, Chianti. So, i think it's a question of education 
uh, but telling stories about individuals who work, for example, in Chianti to explain to people what it takes, what kind of sacrifice you have to make to make an authentic wine uh, that is a Chianti. And then maybe you, that will encourage people to try the real thing uh, and ask questions and to think. I mean, that, you know, that it takes a certain amount of uh, knowledge as well as thought in order to uh, appreciate products that are authentic. Uh, but when you do take that time, I think you can have a great experience and get a lot of satisfaction and pleasure. It's the same with the cheese that Sam mentioned. You know, if you try a real Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, you may or may not like it, but you can see what it's like in terms of the texture, the intensity, and and what it can bring in the flavor, as opposed to the stuff in the can, which tastes like uh, paper, <laughs> to be charitable. There may be paper in it, I think, right, Sam? Yeah, right. Maybe yeah. wood. <laughs> wood, yes. Yeah. Cellulose powder. Yeah. No, no condition. Well... For now, we don't have any any more question, I guess. Uh, ah, no, we have one more right now. It's uh, type uh, for Dave. For mm -hmm. Dave, ten years ago, I was in Australia. Some people were happier to spend more money on authentic Italian food because it was pretty expensive. Authentic pizzerias were always packed. Isn't is it the same in Pittsburgh and in the U.S.? Well, you you're raising a topic which is close to my heart, and I think Sam as well. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's family uh, has a restaurant in uh, which makes pizza, and the answer is yes. In the last ten to fifteen years. Um, the quality of pizzas has become uh, elevated. The, you see now people um, importing ovens uh, from Italy and using wood-burning uh, uh, ovens to make authentic uh, pizza. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, I don't know, Sam, if you know uh, Tony Giermarata, from, who had Pizza Italia oh, sure. recently, but he imported uh, flour from Italy to have a special blend of flour and uh, so yes if you educate people as to uh, the quality of the product and the authentic product they're willing to pay extra uh for example for pizzas wouldn't you say sam uh absolutely i mean sure i mean the price itself will tell you absolutely it doesn't uh, uh billy and your your family's restaurant have an authentic uh, oven for making yeah. pizza from yeah. naples right right from naples right is that use wood or coal? Or wood. 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 Wood, yeah. Wood. Yeah. Really good. There's some good pizza now in the United States. Uh, very popular. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, food culture, uh, as the idea of foodies is something that really uh, is new in the United States. Uh, I remember when, when I was, uh, let's say, in college, the quality of the wine was just so bad. Uh, you, you know, if wine yeah. wasn't sweet, it wasn't any good. And Dave, mm -hmm. you can address this. Yeah. I'm probably a little bit better with the beer. I grew up in a, in a pub. Uh, but uh, when I was younger, wine uh, was always very, very light and really didn't have any tang or, 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 or any uh, any taste, like like a Guinness. And so I think that slowly America is, is starting to develop a food culture, but uh, it's not, you know, a priority like it is in, let's say, uh, uh, in France and, and Italy. Well, think about England. I mean, the, the food culture in England is really, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, th that's quite new. So that, that, that's that been, I think, one of the important developments. And I don't know if it's fair to say this, but if you think about the food culture in Italy, two of the most important corporations in the United States are McDonald's and Starbucks. And neither of them is going to tell you that they have great food or at least great espresso and cappuccino. <laughs> For me, that's a that's a pretty uh, a pretty big irony. You know, with Italian wine, Sam uh, and everyone else, it used to be um, 20, 30 years ago, uh, they would not export them in a way that allowed the wines to travel well. They mm -hmm. would be warmed up in uh, containers, and that would really make the wine taste bad once it arrived in the United States. But now. 
Many winemakers are sending their wines in uh, temperature controlled containers and uh, also sending some of the better wines to the United States. It used to be the old saying was Italians kept their best wines in Italy to drink themselves and, and exported the stuff that was of mediocre quality. That's changed, I think, in the last 20 to 30 years. There's some really outstanding uh, wines coming from Calabria, for example. Right, yeah. We were talking sure about the other day, uh, you have um, the wine from uh, Lassino, uh, from San Argentano uh, in, um, in near Calabria, near uh, Cosenza. And many, many other examples of how they're very small producers of Italian wines who are exporting their wines now to the United States. Well, so that's I, good. That's really yeah. good. It's really encouraging to see that. I, you know, and I, I think you know this all goes in hand with the idea of globalization, and this exchange. But this exchange is very, very much dependent on technology. So better systems of transportation, better mm -hmm. systems of uh, information, uh, being able to see, being able to talk to people that, that really have their feet on the ground. So if we went to to a, a factory that made Parmigiano, we would realize that the stuff in uh, in, in, in the uh, you know in the, in the little can yeah. isn't, isn't the same thing. Uh, just while I have a second, I'll take a second. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting, I think, about this exchange is, uh, for better or for worse, there are items that the Americans have given to Italian cuisine, and there are certainly items that the Italians, above and beyond the food on the plate, have given to uh, you know to the Americans. And uh, yeah. uh, we all know about spaghetti and meatballs. So there is pasta and uh, uh, polpetta, but it's not the same as spaghetti and meatballs, uh, you know, in the United States. Uh, and I can tell you that if you did a survey of uh, 100 young kids, their favorite meal would be spaghetti and meatballs and pizza. Uh, there's yeah. wedding soup, which is probably, an, an, you know, and probably there's, you know, some kind of soup like a wedding soup. Uh, you know, in Italy, but it's not like the wedding soup that is universal in the United yes. States. Uh, pepperoni rolls, uh, muffaletta sandwiches. Uh, 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 let, let's see, Parmigiano, uh, eggplant Parmesan. Now uh, there's chicken Parmesan. Uh, banana stuffed peppers. There are, there are a lot of things that the Americans have added to, to Italian cuisine. Uh, and a couple, I think I mentioned this the last time we talked. Uh, there's this idea, which is really a pretty good example of what happens when there is a mass movement of immigrants or, uh, from one country to the other, and that is the Feast of the Seven Fishes. So the yeah. Vigilia di Natale uh, in Italy uh, has maybe a, a style, a tradition, a ritual that is very much tied to the region. But when all the Italians come together uh, in one little Italy in the United States, there's kind of a sharing. And, and one of the festivals that is now very universal in the United States is the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Uh, I can tell you that there is a resurgence uh, of St. Joseph's Day uh, in the United States. Uh, and, and maybe even in Parma, you, you celebrate St. Joseph's Day as Father's Day. Uh, but for the Sicilians in America, it's a special day with the Feast of St. Joseph and the St. Joseph's Day. And you're starting to see a lot of these kinds of things in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Italians uh, gave us vitamins, uh, the Mediterranean diet. There's no better diet than the, uh, than the Mediterranean diet. Uh, the Italians uh, showed the Americans how to uh, can food and put food by. Uh, they started the slow food movement. Uh, this has been very, very important in the United States, the idea of eating uh, locally. Uh, and uh, I've talked a little bit about food television. Uh, and so there are all these famous you know, chefs on, on, on the Food Network. But the very first, uh, you know, celebrity chef in the United States uh, was Chef Boyardee, who uh, grew up, who was, who was, uh, who was born in uh, Piacenza. So the Italians have given a lot to the Americans as far as food, but the Americans have also traded back to, uh, to the Italians. So this global... Uh, Quindi è un contributo equilibrato da parte di entrambe le culture. So this is a, a balance contribute to your opinion, both cultures about food. Is it right? Yeah, so yeah. let's say that we Italians 
took back the recipes when we migrated to the to the states, for example, and then they managed to rearrange the recipes with the resources they have. So that uh, provoked like um, a surplus of um, uh, not price, but of meaning to those recipes. I mean, they didn't have aubergine, for example, for the chicken pan. They didn't have the right aubergine, but they did have the chicken. Is it right? We, yeah, right. It's just a matter Quindi, of... Quindi, la ricetta della parmigiana americana con, uh, con il pollo è stata realizzata perché, perché non c'erano le in America le melanzane e della qualità che era in Italia. Dunque, gli americani, visto che cioè, gli italiani che sono, si sono trasferiti in America in quel periodo, avevano tradotto questa ricetta utilizzando il pollo per mh, vari motivi, tra cui la carne di pollo costava di meno rispetto alla melanzana che in Italia aveva un costo inferiore, eh, mentre invece in America la carne costava di meno, quindi era più... Ehm, più vantaggioso per gli italiani, eh, italiani in America eh, costruire questa ricetta in maniera un po' alternativa, ma in questo modo si sono create delle ulteriori ricette che generano un po' di confusione quando si parla di Italian Sounding, ed è questo anche il motivo per cui ho fatto questa particolare ricetta adesso. Is it right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't disagree. I certainly don't disagree. And I, David, I know your family probably always had a garden. And yeah, uh, well, yes, they did. Yeah, my, my Aunt Frances, who I mentioned earlier, she always grew things. And for that matter, so I'm also half, half French, and they always had a garden as well. So that's a, a European tradition. The uh, In French, they call it the potager uh, garden. Uh, I don't know what they call that. In uh, in Italian, but yeah, you have to have your got to have your peppers and uh, zucchini, you know. <laughs> so that that's something else that the Italian. I mean, for for Italian Americans, having a garden was was a normal thing. Now, food televisions. All, well, you have to plant a garden. What do you mean you have to have plant a garden? You always had a garden. That was that was yeah. part of the deal. You know. Uh, what well, can I tell you? The first time that I went to Italy, uh, my family would say, "Well." Do you, you know, did you ever eat this? Do you like it? I grew up on Italian food. They thought that I'd never ate Italian food the first time I went to Italy. I said, what do you mean? This is what we eat. We eat the same thing that you eat. So that, was, that was kind of a big surprise for me. That's surprising. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Now we have two questions for, uh, for Dave. So the first one is... The higher willingness to pay in all authentic and food, um, to pay is on all authentic and food, or only in pizza? No, no, uh, I think that uh, it, it's the same point that as people become educated to uh, the authenticity of foods from Italy and elsewhere, they are willing to pay extra. For example, uh, on uh, Aceto de Bosomica. You know, people are very, that's very, there's a big interest in balsamic uh, vinegars now. And uh, also the cheeses, the, the Parmesan Reggiano, which I mentioned earlier, and the hams, the speck from uh, Alto Adige or uh, uh, different types of hams out there. So, yeah, uh, slowly but surely, there is a, there's definitely a market for those authentic products and people are willing to pay a little extra for it. And we see, for example, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, smaller shops becoming uh, successful in cheeses and other things. And, and I think, Sam, in the strip, of course, we have a uh, Penn Mac, which uh, has a huge volume in authentic uh, products from not only Italy, but France and all over Europe. Uh, and people are willing to pay a little extra for those, those items. Yeah, and of course, there's Whole Foods across the United States that specialize yeah. in specialty foods. So mm -hmm. I, again, I think that uh, the United States has become a foodie country, but it's only something in the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. We're new yeah. to this. Quindi la passione dei foodie per gli Stati Uniti è iniziata più o meno 40 anni fa. In your opinion, it's like 40 years back. 
tendency from the United States. Yeah, more attention for the food that just developed 40 years ago, in your opinion. Yeah, I, I think uh, just to add to on the wines, it occurs to me that um, people were willing to pay a little extra for interesting wines from uh, Italy. Uh, once they understand the story behind the wine, uh, people are willing to pay a little extra. By that, I mean, you know, in America, 15, 20, 25 dollars, 30 dollars for everyday drinking wine. Whereas when I was growing up, the wines that we were getting from Italy generally were not um, of the quality that justified uh, paying that, that premium. But now there's a lot of young winemakers in Italy who are putting out some very good, interesting wines that people, people seek. And um, so that's a good thing. I think it's, a, it's a question of educating people and, and having them understand, consumers understand what's available and what they're willing to choose to uh, enjoy it there at home. Yeah. And, I, and I think, too, it's, it's the same with coffee. For years and years and years, until maybe the 60s or 70s, people drank supermarket coffee, oh, yeah. which was Robusta, which is a very low grade of coffee. Then all of right. a sudden, with the coffee shops and the specialty coffee, they drank the, the, uh, the coffee, and, and your mouth will tell you, oh, my gracious, this is a lot better. Then they slowly understand, oh, yes, but you have to pay more for it. But Americans are now willing to pay uh, for a bottle of wine, for uh, you know, for a good coffee. So I think across the board, obviously, uh, you know, as the food improves, uh, the, the price increases. Yeah. Quindi la consapevolezza verso una qualità diversa è cresciuta negli anni. So the the, the, um, the awareness towards a better quality of food has grown since the time, I mean, since the 70s, dagli anni 70 oggi comunque c'è stata una crescita di consapevolezza nei confronti dei consumatori americani verso una qualità del cibo diversa, una ricerca del cibo diverso da quello che c'era prima. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, a lot of it's technology, you know, just the, the, me the message can be dis dispersed globally, the idea of globalization, right? The message yeah. gets out there. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, it occurs to me when you're, you, Sam, you're mentioning globalization, the point is to keep in mind that globalization is not always a bad thing if it allows good products to be available, for example, in the United States, as opposed to a lot of effects of globalization is to eliminate some of that authenticity, but Absolutely. it has a flip side as well. It, it can be a good thing. But it can, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's two edges. Yeah. Thank Excuse you. Me. Thank you. Now we have a, a question directly from our president, Paolo. There we <laughs> are, Paolo. Paolo. Grazie. I have a question for, for Dave. Um, as he knows, um, I'm a wine lover um, like him. So uh, I would like to know, maybe you, Dave, you already say, uh, you, you already tell about this. But in, in Pittsburgh, you, you can find autochthons uh, grapes about wines, uh, as well as French wines from Vigneron, um, uh, where you are, you are an expert. So if, if, I come, if I come in Pittsburgh, it's easy to, to find uh, uh, different kinds of uh, autochthons grapes about wines, Italian, like Italian, I mean. Uh, it's a lot better than it was 20 years ago, yes. Uh, we have a sort of a special situation in Pennsylvania in that the government is the retailer of wines and spirits here. But something that um, is developing since the pandemic occurred is that retailers across the country are now shipping wine more frequently and more readily without charging a big price. So you can go to a retail shop in New York, for example, that specializes in Piedmonte wines or wines from, you know, uh, Lake Garda or wherever and get some very specialized wines and they'll ship them to you one or two or three bottles. And uh, it's fun that way. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm very encouraged by the, 
the wine industry these days because you have some very uh, mediocre wines that appeal to people who uh, maybe don't have an interest in uh, you know, learning more about specific wines of terroir, as we say, Paulo, in, in France. Uh, but, um, and I don't think there's a really good word in, uh, in Italian for terroir. The best I heard was uh, uh, ambianza del vino, the ambianza wine, of, of wine, you know, but terroir is such a French concept. Any event, it's a good time to be a wine consumer. There's a, a lot more quality wines being made, and uh, the access is good. Although it does concern me that we have tariffs now from the United States on European wines. That's not a good thing. We have to eliminate these uh, these tariffs on European wines. But that's politics, so why go there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We have another question for Dev, the, the, the last one, and then one for uh, Sam, and then we'll, we will close. Then for Dev, do American winemakers try to imitate the taste of Italian and French wine? Uh, and if so, is the level as high as, uh, as for the pizza? Uh, yeah, uh, I think... Um... I think that there are some who are trying to uh, make wines with grapes from, same grapes uh, with Sangiovese from uh, Chianti region or Pinot Noir from France. So it's not really trying to imitate directly the same thing. But um, I think that they're trying to create their own style given the circumstances, the soils, the climate that you see in California or Oregon and here in America. Uh, it's because you can never have the exact same thing as you have here. And if they try to do that, then they're, they're making a mistake. So I personally prefer wines from, uh, from Europe generally, although uh, you do find some pretty good wines here from New York State, even here in Pennsylvania where we have a very cold climate, and certainly California and Oregon. So... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a matter of taste and what you're willing to pay for the for the wines. Thank I you. To, I used to make my own wine, but not anymore. <laughs> I buy it. Now. It just work. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dave. Now we have a question for Sam. Oh, are there any events for the dissemination of Italian gastronomic culture? Well, I, I think that uh, the more people travel, uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt. Uh, I think that there are many more Italian restaurants in the United States uh, that are, I don't want to use the word authentic, but in the Italian style, because so many people have tried uh, or traveled to Italy. So, so when they come back to the United States and somebody tries to make something that isn't right, uh, that is a, an Italian sounding, uh, the people reject that. So people know what carbonara is. They know what amatriciana is. Uh, they'll cook it at home. Uh, they'll go to restaurants, and their expectation is, if you're an Italian restaurant, uh, this food that you're giving us should somewhat resemble what we ate in Italy. It can't be perfect. But I think that... Sam, we lost you. ...is really uh, yeah. the key to all of us. We lost you, Sam. I hear you. He's back. He's back. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, Beppe, before yeah, we I go, I know we're going to be going pretty soon. I just, I, I know that you guys know about this, but I just want to recommend that. When you talk about Italian food uh, and this idea of immigration, I would really recommend, if people have a chance, uh, to, to, to view the movie Big Night with Stanley Tucci. I think that you really get a good idea of what two cultures are and, and, and how they how they come together. And it's all based on food. And, and so it's a very, very enjoyable movie. Uh, and the other thing is that's kind of interesting is that Stanley Tucci uh, is currently uh, in the uh, in vision uh, on CNN in the United States. And I'm sure that in some way or another that that series will be available to the Italians. It's called Stanley Tucci Searching for Italy. 
And so he travels around Italy and, uh, you know, and tastes the food and talks about, uh, you know, uh, how good the food is. But it's very, very Italian-American. He lived uh, as a 12-year-old for a year with his family uh, in, in Tuscany. He speaks Italian. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not just entertainment. He's really involved in Italian food, the food that his family made for him in the United States. And it gets, gives you another good look of, of this idea of uh, Italian, Italian American. Quindi ci ha insegnato volentieri questo Stan, Stanley Tucci, che è un appassionato di gastronomia su vari livelli, giusto? I didn't hear that. Uh, did you recommend Stanley Tucci as a, a reference to inogastronomic culture? Is it right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's I'm, it. I agree. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to everyone. Martina, have you got any question? If you don't have, we uh, ask to Paolo to say the last we speech. Not much time, but I was willing to ask a question to both our hosts if there wasn't a problem about intellectual properties. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, GI's intellectual properties? Uh, are you are you talking about books and records or for food, Sam? Oh, yeah, food? on GIs, which are products which are protected. I, 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 I could weigh in on that as Sam's thinking about it. Uh, you do see more and more in the United States respect for the DOG, uh, for the wine that guarantees the authentic origin of the wine. And I also see it more frequently now for food in the better shops. Because, as we said earlier, if you can prove to a customer that you have an authentic, uh, for example, uh, uh, prosciutto di Parma or uh, San Daniele uh, ham or Czech from uh, Alto Adige or the Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, people, knowledgeable consumers will pay a premium for those items. So I think that there is some good. Uh, work that's being done and, and I think that there are laws between the United States and the European Union trying to respect some of that, although it's not perfect by any means. But uh, Sam, I mean, what do you think? Uh, have you seen some of that as well? Well, you know, uh, that's interesting. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Beppe or Martini, you can answer this question, but I think about a year ago, uh, the coffee industry uh, in Italy applied for some kind of a registration with uh, UNESCO or the World Trade Organization so that the, the, uh, so that people couldn't sell, you know, fake espresso and cappuccino. So if you called it espresso or you called it cappuccino, it was, you know, it was at least defined so that people could understand it. There's an organization in Italy called uh, Istituto Nazionale Espresso Italiano, and they certainly try to govern uh, like the pizza. Uh, the, the quality and the authenticity of uh, coffee, but I don't know if they were able to do that. But just the fact that, it, that it's out there, I think uh, that people realize that there is a standard, uh, as I said before, uh, could, could be, uh, you know, be, be of some kind of, uh, of a help. Do you know about the coffee and it was accepted? Was the coffee uh, registered or, or not? I think it was UNESCO. I just can't remember what, what organization. Um, actually, I don't think uh, any mixed coffee is registered. I um, I should I should study more about that. I have, uh, actually I have no certainty about that. Beppe, tu sai di qualche miscela tutelata? I really don't know. I really don't know. But uh... no, there are different types, but they are not as for certainty. Mm, Protected in this sense. Mm -hmm. There's a designation for espresso machines, and it's called Espresso Italiano. And so this uh, organization uh, would uh, approve the fact that your your machine uh, could make Espresso Italiano in terms of the yeah. number of cars and the quality. But that's for machines. Machine. Uh, I was thinking about more of a mixture. 
like your hero blend is a mixture mm -hmm. you yeah. know but right. uh, the property on a machine is different than on a product on a product that's a little bit different it's a little bit of a uh of different impact on the intellectual property rights right Governance is a real problem. How how do you govern that yeah. that, that whole process? Again, at least if there's a definition, uh, you know, something like that. We'll deepen that in the future. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you, thank you. Now the word to Paolo, our president. Grazie, grazie, Giuseppe. Uh, Sam, Dave, uh, I don't know how to thank you again. Uh, thank you to spend your time with us and uh, you always welcome uh, uh, to the Associazione Gastronomi Professionisti. Uh, I'm talking from, from Parma, my town, that uh, is the first town uh, heritage gastronomy um, UNESCO in Italy. And uh, as a teacher, as a friend of you, thank you again. Thank you to my association to Martina, to Giuseppe, and to everybody who uh, follow this uh, interesting seminar. And um, I forgot before uh, to thank you, my university, uh, Professor Filippo Arpini, Professoressa um, uh, Mora, Mora. I'm sorry, Cristina Mora. And uh, also I, I show in the video, um, uh, there, there was somebody from uh, University of Udine, so thank you to them also. And uh, what, uh, what can I say? Uh, thank you again, and uh, I hope to see you in Italy, Sam and Dave, or uh, otherwise uh, in the USA when uh, we can uh, in the future. Yes. Sounds yes. good. Thank you thank very you much. So much thank for you. the invitation. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Grazie Paola. Possiamo chiudere stasera questo episodio di Enogastronomia e altre storie. Eh, come Paola ha citato, ringraziamo tutti i professori di scienze gastronomiche che hanno contribuito alla realizzazione di questo evento e speriamo di vedervi numerosi alla pro al prossimo episodio. Certo, assolutamente, anche io mi, mi accodo ai, ai saluti, voglio ringraziare tutti, i tanti followers che stasera ci hanno, ci hanno seguito, le tante domande, voglio ringraziare tutti i prof di scienze gastronomiche, tutti i follower che, sono, che ci hanno seguito anche da, dall'Università di Teramo, dall'Università di, di Messina e... Eh, no, quanti... Quando Sam e Dave verranno in Italia saranno miei graditi ospiti in Calabria. Oh, ah, yeah, un fatto, bello, bello. Guys, you would be our favorite host in Calabria. Yeah, in Calabria, sì. You are officially invited to Giuseppe's home to enjoy a bit of a holiday. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Grazie. Ciao, bye-bye. Also, bye. also Università of, uh, of Foggia. <laughs> okay. Thank you and cheers and good night okay. to everyone. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.